Um, okay, so hi everyone, I'm Flora. This is actually the first time that I'm presenting in person in nearly two years, so actually I'm kind of like nervous. Um, but I'm a multidisciplinary designer. I'm currently based in Tokyo. And I spend most of my time collaborating with scientists in one of Japan's largest technology institutes. And so each of the projects that I've developed there um, aims to transform scientific research into new products, well, proposals of new products, uh, new platforms, or visions of the future. And um, I would say that in general, I'm quite interested in crafting new narratives around uh, emerging technologies. And uh, before I was doing all of this, I studied engineering, and I think that's also why I'm kind of interested in using my understanding of scientific theory and systems as a basis for storytelling or cultural speculation, or for designing things that are like feasible enough to be believable, but also weird enough to be uh, triggering conversations. And I guess the conversation that I'm always um, the most interested in having is the one about challenging um, human centrality. And for me, this conversation kind of started uh, four years ago when um, it kind of started four years ago through an encounter with a spider. So at that time, I was, uh, yeah, I was studying my master's with Studio Does That, actually. And I had a pet, which was uh, shown here, a Colombian funnel web spider. And uh, I was really interested in uh, observing or examining the silk that she was producing. I wanted to know whether the shape of spider webs could be controlled. Um, and one day she stopped, she completely stopped eating and I asked for advice from uh, expert breeders and they told me that there's a possibility that she might have depression. And that kind of marked the point at which um, my interest in making something that was for humans was replaced by a really deep fascination for the spiders themselves. I felt this kind of affection for a creature that was just as complex and vulnerable as I am. And uh, that summer she passed away, but actually a lot of the questions um, and ways of thinking and perspectives that I still practice through my work today can be retraced to this encounter with this spider. Um, so for example, the following year, my dissertation was kind of a proposal for a parallel framework um, where spiders rather than humans are the main geologic actors. So it was kind of a speculative fabulation of a world that was designed and engineered by spiders. And it was also a way for me to examine my long-held beliefs and uh, my ability to envision the future from a non-human perspective. So uh, in this dissertation, in the context of that dissertation, I proposed a series of artifacts that were meant to uh, like prompt self-reflection. So each of the artifacts um, that I proposed kind of examined a paradigm of the modern era. So this one, for example, was thinking about uh, systems of production and consumption. Um, and it was kind of about how, like humans, spiders like to make things. And they kind of understand that to be alive is to form environments, which in turn form ourselves. Um, the things that we make, they're tied to the stories that we wish to tell and they depict the way that we perceive and also arrange the world that we share with others. So this artifact, um, I guess its function is to give users the possibility of a life with minimal impact on the environment through a kind of bio-artificial process of printing um, that would be made possible through advances in synthetic biology and morphological computation. So this was another artifact, um, which was examining the theme of exploration and invention, which is something that I also think humans and spiders share. It's kind of a, like a new type of interplanetary mobility tool that imagines how spiders would want humans to move and encounter the final frontier. Um, so it's kind of meant to prompt the user to think about uh, the future of space exploration and how uh, how we can shift it away from kind of imperialist motives that have marked its past. And the way that it supposedly works is that it captures a polarized pattern at the zenith of solar radiation in a weightless environment. And then it reorients the user towards uh, a direction where electromagnetic uh, energy of the sun is weak due to solar harvesting. And then it allows the user to concentrate the sun rays in its center and then reflect it back into space. So kind of restoring the balance between the solar energy that is used and then the one that is uh, returned to the cosmos. 
So I carried on all these ideas and all this research um, at Thomas Saraceno's um, Arachnid Research Lab for a summer as an intern. I had the immense chance to learn and work with a very talented group of people who are philosophers, biologists, architects, designers, and we um, prepared a show at the Palais de Tokyo, and I worked on the large-scale installations that were co-created with spiders. And then in parallel, I was also working on creating a material library where, we, uh, where I kind of examined the ability of different types of spider silk to absorb particulate matter. So, yeah, I guess through all these experiences trying to think and design and engineer like a spider, I learned three sort of lessons. And these lessons are entanglement, rhythm, and lightness. So first, entanglement. In South Africa, I found there is a local community called uh, the Yombe people, and they weave this, um, this pattern called kon uh, Kondo Buba, which kind of depicts an interlocking series of shapes in a kind of a symmetrical pattern, similar to a spider's web. And when uh, the Yombe people designate a leader as Kondo Buba, they signify that they feel a feeling of love towards a leader who has the quality of, qualities of a spider able to catch its population in its web. So I think these people kind of understood the value of placing human networks within a complex web of life. And whether it's about designing tools or producing artwork, it's always about, I feel like it's always about connecting things like disparate entities embracing entanglements, complexities, and breaching those boundaries. And then the second um, kind of lesson is rhythm. So one interesting thing about spiders um, is that they're pretty much blind, even though they have so many eyes. So they have all kinds of different sensory mechanisms that allow them to tune into the world. Um, they use their webs as extensions of their bodies. Um, and they use vibration to perceive the world. So when actually two spiders meet, the male spider has to pluck its web to the same frequency as the female spider in order for the mating to be successful. So there's an immense amount of um, rhythm in the life of spiders. And uh, I think from that I learned to tune in or to try to understand senses that I could not experience directly myself. And I think I also learned to create a language for things that the world has not developed the vocabulary to describe yet. And then the last kind of lesson is lightness. There's this very weird um, behavior that, uh, that spiders practice, which is called ballooning. It's a method um, of aerial dispersal that they use for kind of like collective traveling. And I think, um, yeah, I think the idea of spiders flying really helped me when I felt really heavy with the world's weight, like in a world where we keep accumulating things and driving ourselves to the, the brink of extinction. Um, I think it's through this encounter with spiders that I saw a perspective of the, wor of the world that is extremely light, um, that I think is also really necessary when we try to use imagination to respond to current issues. So yeah, spiders and in general insects have been a big theme throughout my uh, work. This was a project that was developed with three other really talented uh, design engineers uh, that drew an immense amount of inspiration from insects. And it's basically an open navigation device um, that is proposed as, as an alternative to satellite navigation. The way it works is similar to the polarized vision of insects that uses universal skylight to then uh, orient and place themselves in the world. So the project is called Away, and it kind of aimed to replicate this process of vi uh, insect vision by providing a series of tools that users could use to build their own uh, off-grid navigation device. So the team, uh, as a team, we designed a custom PCB, which was supposed to imitate um, this organ in the eye of uh, insects called the omatidium and also a set of downloadable 3D print files for opening these modern technologies to means of dissemination and modification. And I guess the motivation behind the project was to create an alternative form of navigation um, that would decrease our dependency on satellites, but also increase our own agency by allowing us to move around cities like insects. And um, I think it's kind of interesting when we think of our cities as habitats that are designed for forms of vision and forms of life that are not our own. 
Um, I met a scientist who told me about the Sanzhi uh, city near Taipei. It's a city, it's a, like a pod city that was initially built as a vacation retreat. And then it was abandoned and uh, overgrown with organisms. And one strange thing that happened is that scientists found an unusual number of five new species of orchid mantis. So shown here, it's kind of like an, or uh, an insect that looks like an orchid. And um, no one really knows the reason for this, but all they could observe is that an extremely intricate uh, civilization of orchid mantis with a very complex division of labor had ended up populating this space that was initially meant for humans. And um, they kind of revealed a whole new world of strategies and perceptions and movements and patterns of organization that went well beyond the confines of the human world. So for example, instead of using centralized um, power, they relied on parallelism and cooperation. There's a book that I really love by Jussi Parika, which is the insect media, and he kind of says that he kind of states in his book that um, animal, animals like insects are beyond the communication, of, like the language-based communication of uh, humans, but they are not mute. Instead, they fold their bodies, they contract forces, um, and they establish relations. And they describe kind of their societies not as a collection of um, already existing entities, but as uh, much more elementary things like speeds and qualities and affects. I think this is kind of interesting when we think about the way that we try to define intelligence. So um, neuroscientists describe intelligence as an emergent property of matter. And actually in the fields of design and engineering, I think it's a pretty important thing to try to think of intelligence as something that is not necessarily tied to human logic. Um, I see, I've seen, I felt this need, especially on projects where I'm working uh, with AI or robotics or interactive systems, because often what happens is that um, the threshold by which a certain assembly of materials is recognized as intelligent is associated with its ability to reflect humanness. And actually this tendency is not only problematic to me, but it's also dangerous. First of all, because we limit our capacity to conceive intelligence as something that is beyond our own obviously limited uh, abilities. So that means that we only want to accept or create or relate to things that are like ourselves and that the precondition for empathy is like seeing your own reflection in something. And second, because it perpetuates a relationship to technology that has pretty much brought us to the verge of the sixth great extinction. In philosophy, there's this um, problem called the other mind problem, which poses this question, which is how do you communicate with a mind that is embodied in the world so differently than you that any shared references are uncertain? And I think this is a really central question when thinking about how to accept other forms of intelligence and other forms of existence other than our own. In many of our earlier methods of measuring intelligence, we actually, uh, it actually has to do with replicating human behavior. And the most famous of, the, of those is the Turing test, which is also known as the imitation game, which is a test, well, I guess it's extrapolated as a test where the machine has to pass as human. But actually the original uh, proposed version was sli sli slightly more subtle. Alan Turing had actually proposed the Turing test as a variation of a popular parlor game where uh, a man and a woman have to convince a third player that they are a woman. So in his version, he replaces one of the players with a machine, with a computer, and then basically you might have a situation where the computer has to pretend to be a woman playing against a man pretending to be a woman, or more, I guess more complicated is the computer is trying to pretend to be a man pretending to be a woman. But anyway, the, the point is that, um, I guess the point is that the machine is only being associated with the quality of being intelligent when trying to replicate a quality of human beings that is already in itself so undefined. What does it even mean to pretend to be a woman? Um, and I think it's quite telling because Alan Turing himself pretended to be a heterosexual man for most of his life. There's actually a really good sentence I found in an interview with Benjamin Bratton uh, where he talks about this exact topic and he says, the real philosophical questions 
uh, sorry, the real philosophical lessons of AI will have less to do with humans teaching machines how to think than with machines teaching humans a fuller and truer range of what thinking can be. And I think this is really interesting when we think about machines exemplifying a broader range of what it means to um, exist when given the fact that society relies so much on infrastructures and systems that are actually perceived, managed, and uh, inhabited by machines today. So we have storage warehouses, container ports, data centers, server farms, all of these systems that we depend on to compute, to exchange, to dream, to exist to some extent. It, these are all infrastructures and systems that are increasingly configured for the non-human vision and the non-human thinking. I think I was quite um, yeah, strongly confronted with this on a recent project that I developed with remote sensing researchers at the University of Tokyo. I was working with these scientists to research how reflectance and shadow parameters that were captured by satellites could be used to create accurate, more accurate 3D representations of uh, forests. And the basic idea is that a forest reflectance and um, shadow values are directly correlated with uh, the species of trees that the forest contains and also its carbon dioxide fixation capacity, its light use efficiency, which are all important um, measures of how healthy a forest is and how to, uh, how to manage its uh, resources efficiently. So by using 2D satellite images, the remote sensing scientists could approximate 3D virtual forests in some way, and together we proposed a platform that would serve as a repository of 3D explorable uh, forests, and also in some way as a carbon uh, footprint visualizer. And in this project, I think I really saw how there's a multitude of information that is often actually often information that's essential for the operation of society on a planetary scale that proliferates beyond human vision. And in this case, um, this project was really about, it was kind of a translation project that would translate information that is already being transferred directly between trees and machines into a language that was interpretable by humans. And I guess, yeah, there's a few people that state that the planet is a camera in itself. It's already a repository of material evidence, of forms of registration and processing of information. And these computers, these satellites, the re these remote sensing technologies that we use to uh, detect things like shadow parameters and then manage forests as resources are in the end just translation uh, devices. And they translate data that is captured, processed, and managed out of our own, form, uh, out of our own uh, capacities of perception into a language that we can understand. So in some way, the power dynamic is very easily re reversed. And I think that's why human vision really needs to be um, challenged as the privileged mode of making sense of the world um, if we want to develop technologies in a way that reframes our relationship to the environment. So I guess all of these experiences and reflections um, it brought me to examining the relationship between systems of technology and systems of significance. Um, I'm quite interested in um, the relevance or the accorded significance that we give to information that's registered at different scales, um, which can be disputed or contested or questioned. In the end, I think it's all about how we think about significance, how, which forms of knowledge production we think are significant, which ones we erase or discard or label as unintelligent or too close to the other. And to me, that those are the central questions when um, that we should ask ourselves when we are uh, developing new technologies um, because these modes of significance um, need to shift away from the humanist beliefs that the world was created in our image and uh, given for our needs. So I just want to end this presentation back where it kind of started with spiders. When I was uh, working at um, Thomas Araceno studio, I was tending to a lot of rare species and there was this one species of uh, spider that had a kind of parasitic wasp that was living inside its brain and um, the, the parasite would gradually change the way that the spider would, uh, would perceive geometry and then eventually the spider would slowly change the way it would, spin, it would spin its webs and it would end up building a cocoon rather than a web around itself which would then be used as 
uh, a place where the parasite would uh, lay its larva. And in some sense, this spider became a prosthetic for this parasite. But I think given the pandemic situation that we are in, it's important also to think of ourselves as ecologies of parasitism. We contain 10,000, over 10,000 microbial species that occupy our ecosystem. Nearly 99% of our genes are not even human. So actually our identity and our DNA itself is challenging our centrality, our place at the center. And our extinction, which uh, is, it could be kind of seen as a collaboration between us and these other species that inhabit us. And on the long run, I think the bacteria, the viruses, and all these other elements that are already part of us will probably most benefit from this geological age. And so in conclusion, I would say it's quite important to um, embrace these encounters with other non-human beings or non-human machines um, in order to learn other forms of survival, but also learn other forms of thinking. That's it. Thank you. I don't know, I'm still I'm processing, it's really different from my, my type of work, so like, mm -hmm. uh, still I have to process a, a, a <laughs> bit of information. But I, said, I think it's very, like Sophie was telling me a lot about you, do we have a lot in common? Yes, I felt that immediately, yeah. Because like, human, like architectural design of human, non-human, so like amazing aesthetics, like I really love your work. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah, I'm super interested in learning, like you mentioned, like emergent architecture, right? Or like, I don't know what the term was exactly, but I'm really interested in understanding where the threshold of something being emergent is, like what is considered like a high, like, you know, a different form of intelligence. Yeah, anyway, <laughs> yeah. My only question will be for you, like what's, um, I don't know, for you, future steps so like how do you taking like thinking about taking it further because uh, like in one case we're defining a principle the same like we're, we're learning from uh, from nature but then like we're designing like maybe like I really like that you define those principles from what you learn from spiders but like I don't know it's like after having this kind of body of research like future steps what where do you see you now? Um, I guess like in just my work at the University of Tokyo, the, one of the things that I'm trying to do is actually creating a kind of manifesto or maybe more just design, like design guidelines um, around how to evaluate the technologies that we're working on. Because we work with scientists who don't necessarily think this way, but it's nice to pose already questions in a very early stage and help direct together these technologies in ways that are thinking about other forms of existence. So the way that I was thinking about structuring it is just having questions to ask, different steps of evaluation, and even ways of uh, measuring impact at the end of a project. Um, but so that's one type of next step, I guess, is like trying to bring these ideas into a context where these conversations are not had necessarily yet. Um, in my personal work, I'm not really sure. I try to continue to you know, read and learn and connect with other people who are interested in projects like this. Um, yeah, not really sure. Yeah, thank you so much again. It was amazing. And uh, one uh, of the lines that really resonated with me through your presentation was that you identified that there was not a language to what you were discovering and that you had to kind of create some vocabulary. Uh, so I don't know if you could elaborate a little bit on you know, this vocabulary yeah, how it was uh, thinking of being ill-equipped to really explain some concepts or going beyond the uh, human centrism. Yeah, it's um, actually, yeah, it's a really good question because there's a lot of moments when, uh, and when you're trying to do work that's original where you might feel a little bit like it's, it's difficult, you know, mm -hmm. like when there's not a lot of people around you doing the same kind of work. Although the things that I'm saying, I feel like there's already so many thinkers who ha have inspired me. But um, in terms of vocabulary, I guess like 
it's like the kind of breaking it down into small principles um, of how you can apply certain ideas to different types of projects, even just the lessons I learned from spiders, like using simple words to describe an experience or a framework of thinking. Um, one thing that I wanted to do, I think I mentioned it, I was creating like a library of material um, research on spider silk as like a form of absorption of particulate matter. But I really wanted to create something that um, was accessible to other people as well, like maybe it could be an, ex um, an explorable uh, material archive around the study of spiders, something that I've never really gotten the time to get to. But I think like bringing those conclusions in, but also disseminating them in some way is really important because you get feedback and you also get to make it into a real language that is like practiced by other people than yourselves. But, um, yeah. yeah. I think that's the challenge to uh, it is. take it into practice. Yeah. And that it's not only, let's say, a, a theoretical vocabulary. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And that's why I think like the interaction with other designers, but also the public, is something mm -hmm. that I really want to do more of in, in projects that I'm doing, like the, the navigation device um, project. One key uh, aspect of it was that we wanted to make it uh, open source. So something that could be modifiable. I mean, if you can make the casing out of anything, like the idea was having it be something that is like a, no a form of knowledge production that keeps being produced. Um, but that is an element of uh, work that I'm extremely attracted to and interested in. One thing that you also mentioned at the beginning was the kind of way of triggering new conversations or uh, I think yeah, you, you said like objects that are weird enough to trigger conversations but I really enjoy also when you were saying uh, narratives quite a few times uh, so I think that maybe relates to what you were just saying of maybe this body of knowledge through narratives maybe yeah yeah, yeah. no absolutely like so first the conversation part um, I work with a lot of different scientists I guess who are in different fields and really like my job is just to have conversations it's like all about that it's all about like encountering and having a conversation and like being really present and trying to really converse with someone I feel like that is like 99% of the work that I do and it's really important like it's 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 all about that conversation and then the narrative that you build around it is super important as well it has well personally I find that it has so much power um, and that is a form of vocabulary as well, I guess, yeah. And I think, like, I don't know, it's from my kind of understanding of like, working with scientists, like, in one case, you expect that they have a similar questions, but they have very different ones. Yeah. You come from artistic perspective, or you come from, like, a perspective, like, even questioning that, like, are we even human? Like, if we have this percentage of other, like, uh, microbes, like, inside of us. But, um, yeah, and I think I learned a lot just through like mycelium experiments that I was in the beginning constantly learning for like somebody who has the knowledge mm. because I started from a startup and then I switched to like more artistic practice. Mm. And it was a big discovery that no, it's like even people who are trained to grow mushrooms, they don't think like to grow a structure. They think how to grow mushrooms for food. And it's like, it's a completely different thing. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, I don't know, learning how to simulate its behavior. Like, so I think this conversation is so important because it's completely different. Than yeah, you can be looking at the same thing, but you're not describing it in the same way at all, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's like building its own language. Yeah, and absolutely. It's a collaborative language, but still a, diff a different one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I felt like one thing that kind of uh, surprised me in the beginning when I was interacting with the scientists is I feel like we existed at completely different scales and speeds. I would be talking to scientists who are they're like looking at one experiment that they've been doing for like five years and they will continue to go for like another 10 years and they've written like 10 papers about this one topic and they're working at a scale that is so like minute and detailed and then this pace is slow as well and I'm working on a t it's like we're like on parallel frameworks but yeah that's a that was something I didn't expect I think mm -hmm. yeah, I heard once a scientist told me like I'm working on a protein for the last 15 years, yes. you were like, gene engineering, mycelium. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know, like, 